think I think a lot of our congregations are playing the light. Like, <laughs> we have a you know the fall is when the church has lots of meetings, and so we have a, two meetings up to the finance committee and trustees, and then a, 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 a staff parish, I believe, on Thursday. Uh, prospective uh, member classes after worship. And please join us. Even if you're not a prospective member, you can still join us. I want to thank you uh, for the calendar, for the pastor appreciation, and the cards. I took the cards home and sat at the kitchen table and had a cup of tea in the red room. And it was very, very touching. Thank you so much. So the, the calendar, I haven't forgotten anything like that. That was very thoughtful. So what I'll do is, when you're praying for me, I'll have your birthday, I'll be praying for you. We'll be praying for each other on those days. And we'll do that. That's a great way, of, that's a great idea. And then Mary has an announcement about a change of choir date. For a variety of reasons, um, choir has changed from Monday night to Wednesday night, same time. Um, the consensus of the group is that we can hear ourselves much better if we rehearse in the chapel, so we will be in the chapel. There'll be somebody at the door to let people in. Um, so and if you haven't been able to come because of the night, um, and you now can come on Wednesday, this would be a great time to join them. We're going to be working on a piece or two to share with our upcoming celebration. Great. So. And Mary knows how to pull some good sound out of people, so... Even if you haven't sung, we want to give it a try. This is your opportunity. <coughs> Are there other announcements? Well, let's center ourselves for worship. Thank you. <laughs>
as we extend a hand to one another, especially uh, reach out to someone you don't know or haven't seen in a while.
not doing well at all. He's in the hospital. And I, it, it, I just sit there and want to cry that people have to end up like that. What is his name? Uh, there, Carolyn is the wife, and Bob is the husband. So this is Bob. This is a friend of Cheryl's, who's a Presbyterian minister in Ketchikan. Well, no, they're in Walla Walla. Okay. But mainly for Carolyn, she's, she's really... The caretaker right. for his wife. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, send ourselves to pray and join in singing uh, this hallelujah. service. 
Give our law enforcement a desire for mercy and justice. Give our teachers a desire to teach well. Give our healthcare professionals a deep well of compassion. Give our churches a love for the gospel. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Be in our homes, whether we live with many or we live alone. That our homes would be places of peace and hospitality. And for those within our circle of care, for babies and grandbabies, for the new hope and life they bring. Those among us whose bodies are failing, or for whose minds have become confused. For those who care for them. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious. And for this congregation, guide us. Give us clarity of our mission. And always give us hope. Give us reasons for laughter. And give us courage. As we do your work in this world. And we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us our bread for our needs from day to day. And forgive us our offenses as we have forgiven our offenders. And do not let us enter into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Cheryl is going to read our history moment, and we were just saying, um, this history moment is a little bit different than the others, because it's really wouldn't you say more about the present. So, uh, Sorry. Alice has a little... That's a little change of pace for us this morning. Thank you, Joe. Let's see, Forward in Faith by Alice Knox. The church's task is to show God's love to the world through the life and teachings of Jesus. Jesus has shown people what it means to love others as God loves us. This church has continually asked what it means to be a Christian. As culture has changed, parallel changes have occurred in ways that people experience God in their lives, best practices that nurture spiritual life, and urgent needs for Christian mission. Styles of worship, music, and ways of doing theology are different. <clears throat> Leadership, participation, and experiences of work and relaxation have evolved. <clears throat> Some might say that God and the Bible never change. So hold on here. Yet communication is what is being heard. It is about what is being heard, understood, and known spiritually. <clears throat> what people hear in conversation with God and the study of the Bible changes. God and the Bible are heard new, fresh, and differently in each generation, which is why authentic Christian life in this congregation ebbs and flows. <clears throat> this congregation has been strengthened by women, favored teamwork, and been blessed by excellent lay leadership. It has been active, outgoing, and influential in the community. It has financially supported mission work on many continents. Integrity, spiritual life, and belonging have been nurtured in small groups. We live in a time of disconnection with the church. Hundreds of young people at the gym and in rehab work individually on their bodies, not their souls. Best-selling self-help books teach people how to focus, center, and find their passion in life. With God's help, a healthy Christian church with joiners, not spectators, is able to do far more than individuals can in improving all dimensions of life. Re reconnection requires serving people's <coughs> deepest needs for health, strength, and daily nurturing. This church once served hundreds of children, youth, and adults, nurturing body, mind, and spirit, building community, and serving others. Now it is time to recenter the mission. 
Now is the time for this congregation to grow deep, authentic, connected, and healing. <clears throat> Searchers are looking for open arms, acceptance, and connection. Leaders need racial and ethnic insight into religious and non-religious understanding. Planet Earth needs advocates to defend nature. This congregation has a history of seeing, seeing options, being open to learning and trying new ways to nurture people in God's love and be in mission to the world. This is the door to the future. God bless you. The mission of the church is certainly no less vital. And uh, we're there with, with the community. Once again, as I mentioned last week, let's catch up uh, for the end of the year. This is time to catch up on our tithes and offerings for the work of the church. Just be conscious of that. Um, this past week, I was doing a lot of work to get ready for our stewardship campaign, and you'll be hearing um, from that uh, in November. You'll be hearing from that soon. So let us give up our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Lord, bless these gifts you are to receive, that through them your good word would be announced in word and deed. Amen. And thank you.
You may be seated. And as um, Melissa comes forward to read, let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence the not saying voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it through Christ our Lord. Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. <clears throat> Sorry, allergies. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of, us, of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste and it shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. This Old Testament, bring me down just a notch. This Old Testament lesson um, comes from very close to the parable that Jesus tells here. And it's a really good lesson that when Jesus was teaching, he wasn't coming out of nowhere. He was a good Jew and was reading the Hebrew scriptures. And so this parable that he tells probably came from the idea of reading this passage from the prophet Isaiah. Would you like it on a piece of paper, Melissa? No, it's fine. Okay. I can't have money for this, but I want to use it. Matthew 21, 33. 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves. Sorry. Harvest time had come. Here. <laughs> It's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. So it's much just, for technology. That's not a problem. Yeah. Just go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> then he leaves it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, you have never read, and have you never read in the scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. One who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and will crush anyone whom it, on whom it falls. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable. They realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Mm. We're God of people, God. That's quite a parable. Let us join the singing. As a counterbalance for all that violence, make me a channel of your peace. Will is done. 
Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, given to a people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. I, I, I realize that that is a lot of reading that you've heard this morning, probably stuff you hadn't heard, and uh, quite violent. And, and, and many of you go to the next slide. Many of the um, parables in the Gospel of, of Matthew, they, they read with, with a lot of violence. And you're opening up the scriptures and you're thinking, well, is that necessary? But then the world we live in is really violent. I mean, it's part of being a, a fallen people. And at the time when this particular gospel was written, Jerusalem, that holy city, was under siege by the Roman government, which led to a really bloody episode. It was a bloody chapter in Israel's history. And there's been many. Even now, it reflects what's taking place in the last few weeks of the war in the West Bank, of Jews and Palestinians. What has erupted? The anger, the rage. But that, that story of violence is embedded within <coughs> Judaism and Christianity. Well, it's embedded within all the religions. That's the story of the cross. It was a, a very violent act of an innocent man. And we can hear that violent act referred to in the parable. There was a lot there, so I'm going to read that line again. Finally, he, referring to the landowner, sent his son to them, the landowner was trying to get his weight, his, his fruit from his, his vineyard, saying, they will respect my son, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come kill him and get his inheritance. So, we, we, we may be put off by it, but the Bible is about the real world. It's not a make-believe world in the Bible, it's handling with the real stuff. And the violence, you know, isn't just in the Middle East. Right now it's in all parts of the globe. It can be difficult to keep up with the wars taking place. It's not just Ukraine and the Middle East. It's, it's parts of Africa, parts of Europe. And then, you know, the gun violence in this country of men, women, and young adults against themselves and one another is another statement of that dark side. And Lord have mercy, right? May we heed what Jesus says, let us produce fruits of kingdom. The fruits of the kingdom, and that's, that's what I want to talk about. A little Bible lesson here to help us along. This Gospel of Matthew is set up in such a way that early in Jesus' ministry, and you can go to the next slide, very good. Early in Jesus' ministry, he begins Matthew with, with the Sermon on the Mount. That's, it's only, it's in, it's, in, it's, in um, it's three chapters, chapter five, so the Gospel does the birth, chapter five does these teachings. Is every, is, are you all aware of the Sermon on the Mount? It, it is the core of Jesus' teachings, as chapter five, six, and seven of the Gospel. I encourage you to read those. Memorize it. I've, I've done that because that really is the ethic of the Christian life. It spells out what this kingdom that Jesus keeps talking about is supposed to look like. And it's called the fruits of the kingdom, you know, bearing the fruit, that, 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 that metaphor. You've heard these teachings, and, and, and I'll just say a few of them. You know, a strong one in these teachings is making amends with your neighbor. No longer an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but turn the other cheek, right? He, he, he's really uh, repelled by retribution. No more retribution. If someone forces you to go one mile, then you go two. You, you acquiesce to make that peace. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Because you are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. If you're not familiar with that, I'm not judging you in any way, but I am saying... That's the epic of the Christian life. And to follow Jesus, we need to be aware of these teachings because it's what we're called to live by. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, the remaining 21 chapters is 
just a living out those teachings with the parables, Jesus' encounters with other people, the crucifixion and resurrection. We witness these teachings being played out in life. We could say it's an expansion of that Sermon on the Mount. So, when Jesus in this parable, when he gives this parable to the religious leaders, and he tells them, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's referring to when he says fruits of the kingdom, those teachings, right? He, he wants faithful people and faithful leaders of his people to do and live out these things. So the remedy of violence within that very violent parable is the very teachings that Jesus is calling us to account. That's a big sentence right there, but think about it if you can. And that, that pushes us. We're, we as a people are pushed to the side. First, whether or not we were willing to buy into these teachings, because these teachings are very, very different from the way we live in this world. Like, turn the other cheek, really? And, and I've had in the years a few folks who I appreciated their honesty, who on the way out of church when we were reading and I was discussing these teachings in my sermons, said to me, I just can't abide by them. I appreciate their honesty, right? And the second thing we're pushed to do is decide whether or not we will support one another as a community to live this way and, and pray that throughout life we can live, live in this way. If you were here last week, you may recall the passage was just before this one. The religious leaders are questioning Jesus and they're asking him, you know, who gave you this authority? What, what makes you think you can come into the temple and disrupt us, <coughs> change things? Well, who gave you the authority to, to forgive, to do all the stuff you're doing? Jesus answers the leaders how he answers most people. He doesn't answer directly. Because more important than who has the authority, or by whose authority, more important than who has authority, by whose authority, is whether or not a person does the will of God. And that's the will of God to do these teachings. Doing these teachings, these demanding teachings, is then how we gain any kind of authority. Right. It's what God desires. It's kind of akin to the question is, what does God want me to do with my life? And I, 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 I've heard that question so often. I have asked that question. What does God want me to do with my life? And we ask that question during transitions in our life, don't we? You may have asked that question when, well, we've got somebody here in high school. You asked that when you graduate from high school. What does God want me to do with my life? Or when you go to college, what does God want me to do with my life? I've had people come to me in midlife in a crisis saying, the last 20 years of my life have become, or has become just boring. I, I, I've got to do something else that's unfulfilling. What does God want me to do with my life? We ask that in our retirement when suddenly we're going to have more time. How should I fill up my time? What would God have me to do with it? And the answer is kind of plain. What God would always have us to do is bear those fruits of the kingdom. That's what we're supposed to do. How are you going to be light of the world? How are you going to be salt of the earth? Going back to that Sermon on the Mount. And the odd thing is, if we approach that question, what would God have me to do? Like it's a test, like we don't know. We, we say, should I be a school teacher for younger, or a police officer, or accountant, or whatever? Or when we're retiring, you know, how should I fill up my time? Do I volunteer at the hospital or the library? We, we ask that question like we're trying to choose between door number one, door number two, door number three, and God is playing in all kinds of mystery. And then if we get the wrong door, we're off track. But I really don't think it works that way. Choose a career or direction that best suits you and allows you to live out these teachings, to live out the fruits of the kingdom. What's the best setting for you at this point in your life to 
live as the way Jesus has instructed. And I, I, I actually don't think God cares if you do it as a teacher or a police officer or an accountant or you do it in the hospital or the library. The thing he wants you to do is to do the teachings. Is that clear? I hope so. Recall the Old Testament passage that was paired. A lot to remember here. It came from the prophet Isaiah. Like I said, Jesus must have gotten that parable he told out of that scripture because the beginning is almost the same. A landowner cleared out his walks and brushed the plant of vineyard. He builds a watchtower. He gets it all set. He hires people. And then when he comes back to the produce, it has borne bitter grapes. The vineyard is no good. And so he tears it up. And this is how that passage finished. And yeah, you're right in the right place, right? <laughs> For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed. Righteousness, but he heard a cry. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed. Righteousness, but heard a cry. <clears throat> it's that violence I spoke of. They didn't fulfill their purpose, this vineyard. Israel became Israel to be a people of justice and a light of righteousness to the world. That was its purpose, to fulfill those teachings. The church is no different. That's, that's the will of God, if we're wondering what the will of God is. It's really clear. It's not a mystery. I think another way of dimension to look at this, it helps to realize who owns the vineyard. <coughs> our, 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 our Greek reads, um, there, was one, there was a landowner who owned a vineyard, Okapetesis. I think I probably got that Greek word wrong. Okapetesis, I can't remember my Greek that well. Okapetesis. I believe that's it, it doesn't really matter. It means, Master of the house. That's what it means. The, the vineyard is take, it will, the master of the house owns a vineyard. And it's a really strong title. It's a strong title. It's like that ancient title of master and slave relationship. And that really puts us off. I mean, it should, you know, that oppression. But it can help us in understanding what's going on here. The master of the vineyard calls the shots. The master of the vineyard sets the tone, the conduct, the expectations of how that vineyard is going to be run. There's not much room for the workers for negotiation. If this master of the house is a God we discover in the scriptures, then we know how to operate the vineyard. It's put right there. It's right there in that Sermon on the Mount. Those are the fruits of the kingdom. There's no question about how to operate the vineyard. We're to operate the vineyard in that way. God owns the vineyard. We, we don't operate the vineyard in the way that necessarily we want to, like when we want revenge, like when we don't want to forgive, like when we, when we are good for our word. Those are all gospel teachings. That's how the vineyard is run. It's not our vineyard. It's the master's. And that's difficult for us to hear because, you know, we, 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 we want to be in charge. But the master is in charge of the vineyard. He really owns the vineyard. It's the fullness of the Lord and all that is in it. Remember, the master calls the shops. Yeah. And it's helpful to remember why he put that vineyard there in the first place. To bear good fruit. To bear good fruit. Not sour grapes, as we say. I, 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 I've pastored on congregations long enough to have experienced some wonderful years, but also to have experienced a lot of conflict. And the most terrible thing about that conflict that I have seen in churches is that we completely forget why we're there in the first place. 
you know, we start treating the church like it's ours, we want our way, we start, you know, defining our territories, and it's the master's vineyard, right? Don't, don't we do that in our, our, our marriages or with our partners? We forget why we came together to have a household in the family and to have children in the first place. We get full of conflict, and the very purpose of why we were brought together kind of gets lost. We forget why we wanted children, right, at those moments. Governments forget why they were formed to represent and serve the people. <laughs> so it helps to remember that the vineyard isn't really ours. It's a way to stay tap, step back and get perspective. It's not mine. I am here to do God's will, to bear fruits of the kingdom. To put my agenda aside, to put my want for revenge, to, to, to put my want to be untruthful, to get my way. Finally, there's another line that catches my attention. When the harvest had come, he sent his slaves to the tenant to collect his produce. When the harvest had come, the Greek there is hokairos, easy enough. Hokairos means God's time. There is a day of accountability. The season inevitably, inevitably comes to bear fruit. It's a very direct statement. The time of the harvest has arrived. The master of the house is like tapping the, um, the calendar saying, it's time. It's time now to bear good fruit. It's time, the date is here. I'm coming. I want good fruit. It's time. And um, I believe that to be true. There comes a time to produce good fruit. <coughs> Because eventually, what's the point, right? You've got a lot of number of days. I know this is kind of a harsh sermon. <laughs> but folks, it's reality, right? Okay. We know how to go about our business in the vineyard. We've been told. Now we gain strength from one another and we from the power of the Holy Spirit to live in that way. And I see glimpses of it. That's our hope. I see glimpses of it among us. Let's say amen. 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 All right. After that, I'm heading to the message, I would think. I'm just trying to sing the hot song. Please rise. <laughs> <Before I finish. laughs>
peace of Jesus the Christ be beside us and the Holy Spirit within us. Let us say amen. 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 Join us for coffee.